All right, so on November 10th, I will officially call this meeting of the Amherst School Board to order. It is 6 o'clock on the nose. We'll get started tonight, as we always do, with our public comment section. Uh, I only see one member of the public in a seat. The rest, if you're in the, with the public, you can come on in. I know we have some teachers coming in to present tonight as well, uh, and without masks, or with masks, I should say. I don't recognize everybody. Uh, are there any comments from the public tonight? Okay, seeing none, we will go on to our first uh, item on the agenda tonight, and it was a presentation by Amherst teachers for the 7th and 8th grade electoral model. Okay, I was going to say they don't seem to be in here, so instead, let's go to the consent agenda for tonight. We'll put that, uh, that item on hold for right now. So the consent agenda is its normal lengthy self tonight. Um, so I'll take a motion to approve it first, and then we can go through. There are a couple of items that we'll want to take out and discuss separately tonight, uh, and then we can certainly have any questions for principals as well. But first, we'll take a motion to approve the consent agenda, items 1 through, uh, 1 through 12. Okay, so Terry seconds it. Um, and I'm actually... No, uh, I only have 12 on mine. Are there 13 now? Oh, yeah, there we go. Middle school transition plan. All right, well, that's right. Stephen O'Keefe had talked about that as well. Um, so with this, I'm actually going to put a po uh, procedurally, we want to take out number nine and number 12 for further discussion. Do we do that now or do we do, do, we do, do, we do that after? We can do it after the motion. Okay, perfect. Before the vote. Perfect. We'll do that before the vote then. So uh, any points of discussion on items one through eight tonight? We'll start off with those. Any uh, items one through eight? Any questions for the principals tonight? Beth, you can go first. I have. I'm going to go. I have a question for each principal. Uh, Please do. Can I ask them both at the same time, or do you want me to do one and then? Uh, I think you can do one. I mean, you ask them both at the same time. That's oh. fine. I mean, you're like you'll ask Beth and her question right now. Oh, you're right. Oh, she walked in just in time. So I have one question that's actually for both principals at the same time, and then one that's more specific, but um, looking for both schools, looking at the staff absentee rate, um, how does that compare to pre-COVID? Um, well, you can always really tell how much of that has to do with, because you won't have been in the building. Um, and then is it, with those trends, is there, are you guys looking at any potential trends on those? Yeah, I'll, rates or I'll, I'll jump in on that. So we have not uh, done any comparison for pre-COVID or, or really anything besides provide these numbers uh, at the board's request. So um, we don't have much more information to provide at this time, but we can certainly look into that. Okay. Um, I like to that some of the numbers are extremely high on average. Like we're looking at more than nine days, uh, nine absences a day at one school and four at another, um, averaging. Um, but if we could look at some of the circumstances around it and stuff like that, I think that would shine a better picture on what's happening. Sure. Thank you. Um, and then I do have one more question. Sorry. Anybody else have questions in the meantime? Terry? Yeah, Terry, yeah, and maybe move it a little closer, Terry, too. I'm noticing that. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Um, I wanted to say a huge, huge thank you to the PTA and to all of the parents and extended family who supported the, the Boosterathon. It was, again, an amazing result, and I see that we already um, get to approve some of those funds coming, coming back to what was intended, and so I know that teachers are like, laminators, yay! <laughs> and, and a few other things are coming in, and I love the picture of the um, duct tape to the, the wall that looks like, did you get claustrophobic or was it just kind of? It went on for a little longer than I, than I <laughs> and, and I noticed we have a picture of the very handsome pig, but none of you actually kissing. I have some on my phone if anyone would like to see, because I was there at Clark for the kissing of the pig and he was utterly adorable and very um, well behaved. So I think you lucked out there. You got, you got a very gentlemanly pig to kiss. <laughs> So that was, and once again, Anna, just like she was slimed twice um, so that both schools got to enjoy it, she kissed the pig at both schools, and the kids were so into it, and it was so much fun, and as an added bonus, it was um, Halloween, so we got to see them in all their costumes, and it was good for my little heart to see all of that. 
uh, but I've taken my turn. And so thank you to PTA and all of the parents and all the staff, because you guys really, it's a holistic program. That's why it works. And, and I, is there anything special you'd like to call out for some of the in school portions of it that you really thought worked well? Part of the uh, program, which Victoria knows well also, is a whole character ed uh, every single day for the kids. So that piece was great to, to tie in. But, it, you know, just the whole, um, the, the celebration, the running, I would say we had twice as many parents outside this time also. Um, and we did love on Friday the top sellers. Uh, we took everything out of my office and we had pizza and a movie in the office for those those kids also, so it was fun. So uh, definitely it was a community feel all the way around. Thanks. All right, that was my turn. I, I have a question for Bethany on the uh, the final item that was added to the consent agenda regarding the um, one of the items that we discussed with the Mont Vernon School Board in terms of our tuition agreement extension that started this year was having a program in place to incorporate or basically to check on the well-being of Mont Vernon students as they were coming over to AMS for the first time. Can you give the Cliffs Notes version of, of how that program is going? Sure. So we've always had a number of different transition events. And every year, we always talk to students, too, about what could we do better? What would you like to see? What ideas do you have? Because after all, it's for the kids. So we as adults can think things are going great or here's a great idea. And we've discovered that sometimes the kids are like, no, we don't like that idea. So I've really been looking to the students to give us input as well. So we do a number of different events through the spring from parent nights to um, student panels at AMS to talking with AMS teachers to um, me visiting the school and basically just meeting with kids and saying, ask anything. Um, in addition to that, as they come over to the middle school, we have our launch pads now in the morning. So every Mont Vernon student has at least one other Mont Vernon student in their launch pad. So there's always that familiar face there as well. And then um, our guidance counselors are meeting with students one-on-one -on -one throughout the fall and just checking in and seeing what their transition needs are, how things are going. So largely it's a big thumbs up, some um, that need a little bit more um, check-ins just to make sure that they're really acclimated, but going really well overall. And the goal is to have every Mont Vernon student that is in seventh grade now meet with a guidance counselor one-on-one -on -one at some point if it hasn't been done already, correct? Yep. Okay. So we've, we've always done it in the past. It just takes us a little bit of time sure. to make sure we're doing that without impacting instructional time. Okay. Um, I think the agreement just really formalizes a lot of the best practices we're already doing. So ha has there been any change in uh, parent feedback or student feedback, uh, you know, know, knowing that this is something that's sort of front of the front of the mind for everybody this year, or at least it's brought out with the, with, you know, formalized with the agreement? No, there, there haven't been any surprises. Um, some of the typical transition pieces, but we're finding that with all of our students returning from remote or you know, disrupted school year, so similar themes across the board. Um, so, so nothing really big standing out in that right now. Um, okay, so my other question, um, I'm asking the principals, um, just because it's gonna directly affect your buildings, but I think it might also be an Adam question. Um, so we've hit the point where our younger kids can finally get vaccinated. So we're seeing the end of the road, at least at Wilkins and AMS. Um, I wanted to check in and make sure what factors will be taken into consideration as we move um, from yellow into green status at both of those buildings um, and making sure that all families have ample time to actually get their students vaccinated that want it because the rollout has not done smoothly. It has taken significant amount of time, a lot more than everybody assumed um, right now appointments are available in the, literally in the middle of the night or hours away. Um, so I wanted to make sure all of that was taken into consideration. Um, right now it looks like families, a lot of families aren't gonna have their kids fully vaccinated until after Christmas. Correct, so uh, looking at the timeline in the best case scenario it would have been the week before Christmas that people were finally reached that threshold of having scheduled an appointment, had their first vaccination, waited three weeks, had a second vaccination, waited two weeks to achieve fully vaccinated status. Um, we went from the, the moment that the uh, FDA approved vaccinations for five to 11 year olds, I think that would have been December 22nd or 23rd would have been that date. Uh, given that uh, our holiday vacation starts at the end of that week, uh, I don't suspect that we would move to the green status in any of our schools prior to the coming back in, in early January. So that's the absolute earliest, um, but we are tracking the rollout to see how it goes. And, 
uh, the key is making sure that parents who want their kids to be vaccinated and have that opportunity before we even start seeing them um, to the vaccination availability, availability by early December. And as a point of information, I did see on the news before coming down tonight that the Executive Council has now accepted an additional $22 million in funding for the vaccine program from the federal government. Uh, they had turned that down originally because it was going to be t they were concerned it was going to be tied to ma uh, making mandates in the state. Um, they have declared that they are not accepting those mandates, and so they've accepted the funding um, contingent upon that, it looks like. So it looks like there will be more funds, and they're going to be reopening fixed vaccination sites as well. Yep, I didn't read the full details on that one, but that was the, the gist of it. Good news. Any other, uh, Victoria? Yeah. <clears throat> um, let's see. Let's start with Bethany. Last month, there was discussion about property vandalism at the school. How's that trend going at the middle school? Way down. Way down. So we're not seeing the things that we were seeing in the beginning of the school year. Um, it's been great. John will tell the story that, you know, he, he walks in the bathrooms quite often to wash his hands. And um, students will be like, oh, not again. What what now? And be looking around. He's like, no, no, no everything's good. So um, there's a tremendous sense of ownership and pride in our students. So that's gone way down and um, going really well. OK, great. Um, Anna, yes. I've got a question for you. Can you discuss the individualized student plan? Awesome. So, yeah. so yes, we can both talk to it. So we had two teachers that are piloting um, and um, it's a, a second grade teacher and a kindergarten teacher. So it's kind of taking a, a look at the student as a whole child, if you will. So it has the, the data for the parents on the, the left of the form. There's going to be a self-portrait. But for the parents, it's their hopes and dreams for the students. It's also their individual interests. Uh, then it's a meeting with the students about their own hopes and dreams and then kind of tracking the growth and making those goal changes with each, um, uh, with each quarter. We had the opportunity last night um, with one of our teachers, they came down afterwards and just, it was more the richness of the conversations that they have with the parents and that co collaboration. Um, and then just really hearing from a parent, like I just want him to have fun and relax a little bit, or I really wanna push them in this area. So the teacher, really felt good about the, the, the conversation that they had with the parents. They should have uh, had more time. I think that was the other piece to, for that. Did you have anything? Do you have anything to add? No, I just would add that it's you know two teachers doing this pilot, giving us hopefully lots of feedback on what we think might be a good start. And then we'll figure out what makes the most sense after hearing from families and the teachers um, moving forward for next year. It sounds like it's a start that's really built on um, like the letters that parents can write in about their student for placement the following year, or maybe the information that's shared at conferences and almost gives like a concrete way to pass that along to make sure that all of these things are following the student. Yeah. yeah. And we're actually, we, we shifted and it was one of those things we did in COVID because we sort of had to, um, but we shifted to a Google form for parents to fill out yeah. about their child's hopes and dreams if they wanted to in the spring to help us with placement. And that was really successful. And we did the same thing with incoming kindergarten families this year. So we found that that is also a nice branch into some of this um, wider SAU wide work we're hoping mm -hmm. to accomplish. Okay. That's a great idea. I'll say Victoria. Uh, Josh, do you have anything before I go to Victoria, uh, Terry again? Uh, just a couple quick things. I wanted to um, thank Roger or the facility staff for putting the uh, whiteboard outside. That's a great idea and hope we could see a few more of those. I think that was great. Uh, also wanted to mention, um, I understand the Boosterthon is now happening at AMS as well. Thanks to uh, the woman to my right here and uh, Bethany, Dr. Bernasconi. So uh, I'm looking forward to various barnyard animals being proposed <laughs> uh, for future kissing. <laughs> so we'll take we'll take Terry's final comment on uh, with the principals, uh, and then what we'll do is we'll take a break from the consent agenda before we get into the other two items of note tonight with the uh, the NEWA growth summary and then the uh, the policies that we want to review. Uh, we'll take a break for that so we can go to our seventh graders and eighth graders and their teachers and their presentation. Uh, but Terry, before we do that, I'll let you have the the final say for now. Yeah, thank you. Um, this one is actually for Dr. Bernasconi as well. I wanted to ask a little bit about the, the grant from the Bean Foundation, which I'm excited to see. <laughs> my, my own memories of dissection were not overly positive. So um, tell me a little bit more about it and whether 
kids will have the opportunity to either opt out if they're not comfortable or be able to watch from a distance. Like what are kind of the plans there? Yeah, so our, our seventh grade teachers, are science teachers are knocking it out of the park right now. Um, lots of hands-on experiences for kids. And I think everyone's really been craving that coming back from a year of so much digital. So um, they've, they've already done the dissection. We did put pictures on Facebook, so take a look at all those if you're not of the faint of heart, no, no pun intended. Um, really, I, I was fortunate enough, I got to don my lab coat and go hang out down there for a little bit. Um, I think there might have been two students who are the small handful of students who kind of opted out and did something alternative. Um, most students were really engaged with the, with the whole project. Um, they actually also had a beef heart that they could take a look at, which compared, I mean, it was bigger than my computer. So just for kids to now, they've seen the drawings and textbooks, but to now have that hands-on experience to see how it functions when we talk about the four chambers, when we talk about you know veins and arteries, to really have that hands-on experience to see what it was like and have discussions about you know why is, why is this part of the heart such a thicker muscle than this part and how does that relate to function? So um, it capped off a, a week, so Halloween week was the perfect week for this. So they looked at the hearts, they did some comparative anatomy. They did a great um, bone lab where they had all these different skeletons laid out too and looked at form and function and why are vertebrae shaped this way, but really a great hands-on learning experience. So special thank you to the Bean Foundation for um, sponsoring that activity so all of our students could really have that hands-on learning experience. <laughs> All right, so we'll take a break from the consent agenda for now because I'm sure that the kids that are here are uh, not excited to hear about some of that stuff. So we'll take a break. Uh, we do have a presentation tonight from uh, some of our Amherst Middle School teachers and students regarding a, a new elective model for integrated arts. So I will have, Beth is gonna turn the microphone on. Uh, if you guys would like, all like to crowd around that table so we can hear you in here, but also on the video um, tonight for folks that are watching or listening from home now or in the future. Um, please handle introductions and then uh, we'll let you take it away. You guys can like pull chairs up so it feels a little less creepy. You guys want like, to pull your chairs up? Okay. <laughs> so while they grab their chairs, um, they've asked that I introduce them. These are four of the students that I currently have. I've had them before, but we are, um, I'm pleased to be able to have them as um, yearbook students this year. So I normally teach computers. This year I'm teaching um, a couple different electives that we're offering, including yearbook engineering and coding, um, which to be completely honest as the teacher in this, I didn't expect to have this much um, interest in those programs right away initially. Uh, I, we have two different classes and so I have four ladies with us today just to share a little bit about electives in general and um, their experience in yearbook. Do you, want me to, do you want to explain who you guys are first? Okay. So I'm also supposed to tell you guys who they are. So this is Olivia, this is Kenzie, this is Callie, and this is Eva. Okay, cool. Um, hi, my name's Olivia, and I wanna share some reasons why electives have contributed to my personal growth. They've given me a choice in learning, unlike in recent years, or given me a choice in my learning, unlike in recent years. Electives help with having more classes that you are interested in, rather than just having classes that are required, but I may not be interested in. Electives take up an important role in young adults and teens. They teach us how to be respectful and communicate in a work environment. They allow us to put our ideas into good use and give us a sense of importance and pride, doing something that we choose to do. One of my elective, electives in specific is yearbook. In the yearbook, I've learned how to take photos, how to market and design ads for the yearbook, how to interview people, and so much more. Yearbook has been an amazing learning experience, but it also has given me opportunities to step out of my comfort zone that I wouldn't have had in any other class. For example, I've had to collaborate with students in other classes, and also I've had to communicate with teachers around the school. Yearbook class gives you the opportunity to be a part of something bigger than yourself. In the future, when you look back at the yearbook, it will be special to remember everything about eighth grade and how you contributed to it. I think having students involved in creating the yearbook is a great way to include them and get them ready for high school. It's a combination of collaboration, marketing, programming, and editing. Also, it includes a lot of financial work, creativity, responsibility, and organization. 
That concludes our reasons for why electives are beneficial to students. Thank you so much for inviting us here tonight. Thank you, ladies. Before you guys get up, I want to make sure the board doesn't have any questions. Does anybody have any questions for them to keep them on the hot seat? Victoria is jumping out of her seat. I am jumping out of my seat. Um, I, I know a few of you, and my kids are around your age, so hopefully this isn't too scary of a question. Um, I was a yearbook editor in my high school, and I'm excited to hear about how you feel the elective program is different. Is there one, if you had to pick one thing, and only one of you has to speak, but if you had to pick one thing that's your favorite part of the yearbook, what is it? Um, I think just like having something to look back on that you know that you like contributed to and that like you made would be just gonna be really cool to like have. Yeah. Great answer, girls. Yeah. Good job. It's <laughs> also cause you kind of get to, um, look back at it, like she was saying, and be like, I w was like one of the people that made it, but you also get to add some of like the more creative parts. So like you can ask your classmates and be like, hey, can I have some pictures for like baby photos? Or like you get to like add in, like come up with like ideas for like different pages and like different things. That's great. And it's really a huge testament to your staff also right, to be able <laughs> to have these kids who are able to come in and talk with us about it, which we know is, is feeling like the hot seat, um, but also to give them those opportunities that are varied is, is wonderful. So thank you. Um, so is a parent of a kid close to your age, I know several of you, um, I in experiencing this on the parent side, but I want to make sure everybody else is aware of this. What are some of the classes that you, I mean, we know about the yearbook, but what are some other additional um, classes that you've been able to select as this elective, you know, as part of the selective cycle that you would never had the opportunity to take as specials before? Because you guys are eighth graders, you've been through it all. So your book is one, what are some other ones? Oh, um, one of them is photography. Like that hasn't been a class that you could take normally, but like I feel like a lot of kids are enjoying taking like the opportunity and getting to take photos and like just getting to like learn how to be a photographer and stuff like that. So that would be one. And like we have like more art programs and stuff. So like we have more diversity and like so you can choose like exactly what you want to do. Ceramics or uh, printing. Oh, yeah, you yeah. can do printing. So I think it's like fun just to have like something that you want to do, and that's like kind of just designed to your liking. But uh, I did it again, Terry. Sorry. It's been a long day. <laughs> At least it's only Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Okay. So I was also on yearbook and just a, a little tidbit, um, I got a scholarship one year in college for being on yearbook that paid for about half of everything. Just, you know, for parents out there who think that might be interesting to know. <laughs> and it was like our 200th anniversary. So having something, I very much understand you saying, having something to look back on that you got to contribute to is a huge deal. Um, do you feel like it making you a little more prepared to get here to the high school? And, and when you do get a little more choice and, and getting to practice that a little, a little sooner, um, you're more excited when you're gonna have that here. Does that feel like it might yeah. 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 be less overwhelming? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yay, we'd love to hear that. A little bit better. <laughs> by the way, you all did a great job presenting because I know that's kind of scary. And even though we're very not scary people, when we're all together, we look scary. <laughs> So y'all did a really great job. We, we always love when, um, when you come and visit with us because it's really boring otherwise. So, so thank you. Just don't leave now so we have an audience for the rest of the night. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else, Josh? Well, thank you ladies and thank you to Ms. Oltman for uh, putting this together. An impressive program. And when does the yearbook come out? In the spring, I assume, the correct? The end of the year. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. I didn't get a scholarship in your book, so maybe some of us don't know these things. So they're sharing to us. This is not like this program is not going to go away, right? Because it's awesome. 
can we please keep out yeah so like the program so this was our first year kind of a soft rollout of our of our electives um we have a new schedule for well everything is new this year right so there's a new integrated arts schedule um that was reflective of things that they felt passionately about um more contact time for kids getting away from a six-day rotation and, and moving to that more choice in the seventh and eighth grade so this year it's been a soft rollout we told teachers if there's something you have ready to go and you feel passionate about, we'll put that in as an elective. And we're gonna spend this year and this spring developing additional electives um, so that teachers have the curriculum time and development to really flush out what those might be. Um, whether it's it's um, adding in things, uh, not just general music, but adding in specifically guitar classes or some of those other pieces. Um, you know, there might be some different fa family and consumer science classes that are more tailored to students. So we've kept the, broad general program as well so there's an art experience which is a little bit more the typical art experience that students would have in seventh or eighth grade but also an opportunity to specialize the other really nice thing is it also gives the kids a chance to if they're really passionate about art take more than one art class or um, for the first time students who want to can take band and chorus so it's not an either or um, situation in seventh and eighth grade now so we're going to continue to work on developing these and, and have some more offerings and balance those offerings. They may change from year to year so that we're not trying to have a teacher teach eight different things at once and have that not be sustainable, but um, we'll continue to add in those offerings. Anybody else? Okay, so before we go on to the NEWA presentation and just get a, a look at the numbers from the growth results, there is one question that I had for Adam regarding the capital improvement plan. Uh, if, if you haven't seen this, it's a, uh, basically there's a, a framework you go through and the, the town gets together with the school district and they lay out a list of projects and what the funding is going to be needed for these and, and when they're going to be needed and they lay them all out together so that there's a roadmap for everything to be in conjunction so we know that this tax hike is going to happen for the town at this time so maybe the next year the school board or the school districts add their tax hike for whatever projects they might have. Very simplified version of it, but uh, in item number 43, for the school projects, uh, there is a radio system bond recommended for FY28. My question, Adam, is if a new school project gets approved, would this or could this be rolled into the $83 million bonds uh, that gets approved next spring? Okay. okay. It's not gonna be a bond. This wouldn't be a bond, no. No, this wouldn't be a bond, but <laughs> I'm saying, Excuse me, no, it, it was just a, uh, it would be expendable trust fund for the capital projects, which we funded through um, voting the last two years, I think, and it'll certainly be on the ballot again this year, but I, I misspoke in the bond, but um, it will be pre-funded essentially, yes. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Christine if uh, you would like to talk about the NEWA growth report and uh, we'll have any questions to follow up. Yeah, thank you. Um, so included in your packet is the report from NWEA that um, shows student growth from last fall to this fall. Um, the report only includes students that had test events in, in both dates, so um, fall of 2020 and fall of 2021. We did um, uh, provide NIWA remotely for any students who were remote last year, so if they, um, they certainly could have opted out, but remote students did have the opportunity to participate last year. Um, as well as this year. So for our very small group of VLAX remote students, they were all offered NWEA and most of them did participate in NWEA of our, our current remote students this year. So in looking at our, um, I'm gonna start with Clark Wilkins. I know that's on the last page, that's how NIWA <laughs> reports it, but um, a little bit easier to start there and I'll start with um, English language arts. Uh, you can see that um, uh, one thing I wanna point out is the scale is basically, um, you know, a, a pretty small scale. This is showing how many RIT points students made in growth on average for that class and what um, NIWA growth projections say they should have made. So the diamond is what they, um, according to norms, they should make in growth. The bar is what is how much they did grow, how many RIT points from last fall to this fall, which is why we don't have kindergarten, a, a bar for kindergarten. Um, and in looking at um, reading, uh, uh, our younger students were certainly more impacted last year. And Kathleen and I had some pretty extensive conversations about this. And um, one of the challenges uh, um, for students, especially kindergarten students, we're teaching them um, phonics and phonemic awareness, showing how we, with our mouths, make sounds. And they 
can't always see that well and we can't always see the students. So masking was a challenge specifically in this area and in, in these foundational skills. Um, so we've done everything we can to support them. I know a lot of times kindergarten goes outside, takes masks off for our Hegarty phonemic awareness lessons or our foundations lessons, but um, even with foundations that can be a challenge. There are a lot of materials they have on magnetic tile boards and then there's tiles all over the place <laughs> outside. So we've been doing our best certainly, but um, it's not surprising to see that our, uh, some of our youngest learners were uh, typically kindergarten um, often does meet or often uh, many times exceeds that target growth. And um, it looks like they, um, in looking at um, first grade, which again, a representative of that kindergarten year, um, they um, should, their projected growth was um, almost 20 RIP points and the observed growth, growth was 13 RIP points. So um, remember, the lower the grade level, the more RIP points they're expected to make. And again, these norms are pre-COVID norms. Um, so overall, um, in looking at this, it's certainly not terrible with the growth that our students made from last year to this year, given some of the, the challenges we had last year. And second grade was pretty close to making their growth. Third grade did, and fourth grade um, just about um, made their growth there for reading. And in looking at second grade, um, the um, projected, the observed growth, they made 15 points of RIT growth and projected 18.7, uh, so a few RIT points off. Um, there. Um, and in looking at um, continuing with um, reading language arts for the middle school, um, again, and uh, you know, there's um, uh, lots of reasons why uh, students may not have made their writ growth. Um, it, it's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what that is. I know uh, it was a little easier in the, the younger grades where we could see that stark difference. Um, and kind of pinpoint what we thought was different for those students and why they may have been mm -hmm. impacted. Fifth through eighth grade, um, you can see that they, um, you know, none of those grade levels, which again, fifth grade is looking at fourth grade instruction. Um, and, and as you move up the grade levels, some uh, almost made it. And again, these scales, this scale is pretty small. So I just want to make sure everyone's clear on that. So, so it's um, one point of RIT growth. So if you look for sixth grade, although they missed it, it they missed it by about one point of RIT growth, which is um, not significant. Um, uh, you know, it's a pretty small amount there. So the scale is different on the middle school one. So I <laughs> just wanted to point that out. Um, but it's, it's more challenge. It's a little bit more challenging when students, um, uh, as they get older, there's let less um, a, a amount that they're going to grow less on that RIT scale. They're only growing two or three or four points, you know, in a year. Um, if they miss that by a point, you're, you're seeing that there in that growth. Um, for math, um, and I'll go back to Clark Wilkins for math. For math, we were really pleasantly surprised. The, the um, national um, trends around math was that uh, students were most disrupted in math. Uh, and that it had a more sig significant impact on students. And again, this isn't showing whether or not students are meeting grade level expectations. This is showing how much they grew in a year. But we know students lost um, when we were remote. Um, so in looking at when they came back to us in the fall, did we make that year's worth of growth with them, which we definitely wanted to make, if not more. So we were pleasantly surprised math was an area we needed to make that growth. And in most grade levels, we were able to hit target growth and in some um, cases exceed that target growth there. Um, and again, with that um, first grade, um, a kindergarten experience with, with masks is <laughs> very different. Um, and, you know, in with, any of the grade levels, if a grade level was significantly you know, impacted overall, we're looking closely at the individual students in that grade level and we're providing interventions and supports to those students. Um, and in looking at math in um, the middle school, again, um, fifth grade basically just met or uh, kind of just touched <laughs> um, and met their growth where sixth grade and seventh grade exceeded their growth in math, which is really exciting and eighth grade didn't quite um, make their growth. So in the areas that we were most concerned about, we, we did see at least in, in many grade levels um, close to that year's year of growth and in some cases even more. Um, it, it's hard to say in language arts why we didn't see as much growth um, in students in that middle school uh, grade level. It, 
we definitely want to also take a look at the um, New Hampshire SAS scores, which last year those scores were really difficult to use. As you know, we had so many middle school students opt out that I don't know that that's representative, but really keeping a close eye on students who are not um, you know, showing the progress that they should, providing those supports. We have a really strong MTSS program at the middle school. And then really looking at this spring and looking at the state assessment results to see where students are in meeting those grade level expectations. So this is a quick snapshot in um, how much growth our students were able to make last year from this year, looking just at NWEA. We know in the classroom, um, sometimes you know, kids can have a bad day on the test or you know, by the eighth grade, some NEWA testing fatigue, <laughs> certainly possible. Um, but this is a, a quick snapshot and can be helpful for us to gauge how our students are doing. Thank you, Christine. Questions that people might have. Terry. So I noticed the same anomaly that, that math, they were kind of like middle school at least, math, it flipped. It's normally higher in reading and then suddenly it was so much higher in math, which yay math, but right. I'm looking at our achievement percentiles though and it looks like achievement percentiles are quite high and that may be one of the reasons in reading that there's not as much growth because they were already at a pretty high achievement mm -hmm. level. Could that be one of the factors possibly? Um, Yes, um, it's a little more complex than that, but um, to simplify for the crowd. Yes, to simplify <laughs> for the crowd. Um, they still have the ability to grow just as much, so we would like to see that. But the good thing is, when you're, um, if you're talking about whether or not they're meeting grade level expectations, we do have very high achievement levels, which means that that um, usually if a grade level is over the 60th percentile in general, they're typically meeting grade level expectations. So the positive, you're right, if you look at um, reading language arts for Amherst Middle School, those achievement percentiles are between the 70th and the 80th percentile. So those are really strong results. So while they may not have grown as much, it could be that students were so focused on math last year because our teachers were so concerned about where students were in math and trying to catch them up with math that there was more focus on math. Um, that they maybe didn't quite meet their growth targets, but um, achievement is still high. But it seems like it might also be an area that's ripe for enrichment, which is another area that we know we really are wanting to focus on. Yeah. And so that may be something that we know that we're doing well overall, but to allow for growth, mm -hmm. we really need to step up our enrichment opportunities, yeah. which I was happy to see some of those happening at our lower grades. And I know that we or having, you know, across the board, we're really trying to find ways to provide those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I'll say one other thing, it is exciting too, in looking at the um, achievement percentiles in math at the lower grade, that has been our concern is math. Um, as we've shared during many of our budget discussions, the need for new math materials um, and, uh, you know, just uh, having older materials not as tightly aligned to standards and really wanting to incorporate the newest research around how how is it best to teach math. Um, our teachers just this year are starting to pilot materials, but they worked so hard last year to really make sure that they were hitting those most important grade level concepts to ensure that we were filling in those holes and gaps to then be able to move ahead with students. So it is really exciting to see that. Victoria. Um, so I am looking for some clarification about the column on the, that says percentage of students who met growth projection. Mm -hmm. um, I was hoping that our number of students who met that individualized growth projection would be higher than 50% for many of these tests. Mm -hmm. And I think there's only a couple, maybe, maybe a small handful um, mm -hmm. who did. And so can you just kind of describe that? Yeah. Uh, so the um, if you look all the way on the left-hand side, the total number of growth events, that's the total number of students that took both tests. Um, so that when you go to the end and you're looking at, um, there is a little bit of a difference. The, um, the grade level norms, you know, there are certain sections on those, those tables. If you look at the grade level norms, this is looking at the grade level as a whole and whether they've met what's expected as a grade level or school growth, where the student norms, that table at the end is actually looking at individual students and whether they met their own individual growth targets. 
So um, the goal is always for us as a school to have about 50% of our, our students meeting those growth targets. That's typical growth, that 50%, that's average, um, is 50% of that class meeting target growth. Now we'd love to have our students growing more than average and more than typical, um, but that is showing how many students um, and what percentage of students individually met their growth targets. So just to follow up with this, I know this was a question that I had submitted through Tom and we might have to wait for mm -hmm. some information, but yeah. um, I'd love to get some information. As a parent, sometimes you can get the quadrant mm -hmm. report. So it shows if you're um, high growth, high achievement, mm -hmm. low growth, low achievement, kind of on that matrix. Um, I would love to be able to see that information yeah. for cohorts, not mm -hmm. obviously not for individual students, yeah. um, but for cohorts to kind of understand, you know, when we say 48% or 36% of students hit a certain target, which students are those? Yeah. Um, so that we're aware of what's what's really happening when we mm -hmm. take these through. Yeah. Um, and I did share with um, Tom, the. it's a little frustrating. I, I wish the, that quadrant report was available at the grade level. It's not, it's only available at the class level, but I can take each class report, um, aggregate them together and then provide a report to the board. So I'm happy to do that for next month. And you will secretly enjoy it because you love this stuff. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I will enjoy it. It is interesting. I always wish I had like, you know, it's just the data. So what's, what's the reason or the answer? You got to dig a little deeper and we can only make a hypothesis, but it is fascinating to look at. We have to go to you. Um, so we've talked a lot in, I, I know that pulling um, remote students data is not easy. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know that it's going to take a little bit of extra time, but I think that there was some concern about how our remote students mm -hmm. fared, especially our remote only students, because mm -hmm. we did have some that were hybrid. Um, how they fared um, in making sure that their experience is okay, maybe mm -hmm. even aggregated to a grade level mm -hmm. or something like that um, for next semester would be great. Yeah. And I just have one really quick question. What is SD, is a growth, um, observed growth SD? Um, it's, um, yes, it's this, I think it's this uh, observed growth and I think it's the standard error, which oh. means that um, how much error is in um, that, uh, so you know, when you get your individual scores for students, you always see like, say they're a 183 RIT, that usually says like 180 to 185, for example, there's usually a range in there, that's your standard error. So this is showing you how much error could be in that growth. So if we look at, um, for example, if you're looking at first grade, the um, there's 1.1 RIT points of possible um, error in there. So if we're looking at observed growth, it really could have been that it was 14, essentially, or it could have been that it was 12. Thank you. That helps. <laughs> yeah. so can you just explain the achievement percentile? I'm mm -hmm. looking at the language arts um, for Clark Wilkins. Just that happens to be the one that I have on. Yeah. Um, so the, what they do, um, NWEA takes the mean RIT score for that grade level and these are a whole different set of norms than individual student norms. And they look at um, where that, uh, that RIT score falls on, on their norms. So if it is, if your grade level RIT score is typical and completely average, you'd be at the 50th percentile. If we have higher RIT score, average RIT score for that grade level, um, then we would be above that 50th percentile. So, um, you know, as a grade level, we're in the 72nd percentile for first grade for achievement, which is high achievement, being, you know, almost at the top. Sure, it, it is. But when I look at the fall 2020 category for that, it shows 97. Yes. So that's saying that we used to be in the 97 and now we're in the 72nd. Yes. Okay. So we did fall. Are, and that is based on your mean RIT score. So if you look at the 145 RIT and you compare that to uh, norms, uh, that's how they get 
that achievement percentile. If you, if a grade level as a whole makes their target growth, you typically stay at the same achievement percentile. So we did not make our expected growth, which means we, our percentile fell. Um, and again, the, there are tables that show, so again, what's a little tricky is you can jump a little bit. So it's, it's um, I, I would have to look to see where would the 97th percentile have been for that RIT score for that grade level for fall testing to see how different of a RIT score it would have needed to be um, to give more context to how much that, that feels significant that we lost. I mean, it certainly is. We're in the 90th percentile and fell to the 70th percentile. Um, but how much RIT growth of catch-up do we need to do to get back there? I'd have to look at the norms. Sure, and I mean, that one's first grade, I think, but when, when I look overall, let's say that there's 16 grades and different tests that we're looking at, mm -hmm. and we know that there's like eight or nine of them that are, so more than half of them have dropped in that percentile. I just think it's something mm -hmm. that we should note that, um, you know, and obviously the 97 to 72 in first grade is a large jump or a large drop, which we've already discussed. Um, but, but I think there are drops in other ones too that are worthy of us noting. Um, my one other question is the language arts for eighth grade, there's no blue bar? Yeah, it was zero. Was it zero or negative or what? It, it was zero. So if you look in the table for eighth grade, the under observed, under growth section and observed growth was zero. Mm -hmm. um, so on average, the, the the RIT score was exactly the same from last fall to this fall. And that they should have grown on average as a grade um, 3.9 um, RIT points. And that that um, standard error is almost one, one point. Last one, I, I promise, Tom, I'm just gonna follow up. Obviously, eighth grade with language arts isn't the same as kindergarten with language mm -hmm. arts, where we're saying that the mask had the impact. Um, and I know we've talked about maybe the focus was on math and things like that, um, and therefore reading maybe fell to the side a little bit. Um, my other, my question connected to this, when we take NIWA tests in the fall, we always take them at a certain time and we're given a certain week or two yeah. weeks to complete mm -hmm. all the tests. Who determines when that happens? Um, we decide collaboratively the two weeks that we administer it because we have to go into the NWEA system and tell it how many weeks of instruction students have had before testing. Um, and, you know, each year in the summer, we usually connect and set what those dates are. And we're certainly open to feedback on those um, dates. We've just set it where, wherever we think it will be most helpful, where students have had a little chance to settle in, but also we're getting the data early enough to be able to support students. Yeah, so that was kind of what I was hoping to hear. And I know at the middle school, we talked so much about the importance of easing the kids back into the school and not hitting them with the academics right away. Um, and I wonder if part of our slow to ease mm -hmm. into academics is showing that the kids hadn't caught up to certain things that they would be tested on mm -hmm. from the summer slide type of concept. Yeah. Just curious of it. So. Yeah, it's very possible. Um, it is hard to know um, once we have, you know, multiple years of data and coming off of COVID certainly changed our typical patterns. Um, and, you know, our, our winter results will be helpful and whether we want to compare them to from last fall to this winter to see um, how much students have grown or last winter to this winter could also be really helpful for us to take a look at. So backing up to Victoria's question on um, the achievement percentiles and stuff like that, you, you know, we kind of have to look at cohorts because mm -hmm. this year's first grade is very different than last year's first graders. The kids are different and things like that. So there's an aspect to that. Um, so tracking, you know, I'm looking at Clark Wilkins math. Okay. And just so you know, you don't jump lines like you normally do with cohort tracking. This, you stay on the same line to track the same cohort. So if you're Wait, what? Yeah. Last year's, <laughs> so like if you're a first grader, that uh, showing their Yeah. 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 So the okay. grade level on the left is the 2021 grade level. I wish they actually put two grade levels in the chart 
showing the 2021 grade level and then the 2020 grade level, yeah, which is yeah. a year before. So if you're looking, which, what page are you, Clark Wilkins and oh, reading or are well, you? I'm looking at math. math. So our second, okay, so that explains those numbers a little bit better. I'm like going, wait a second, but our second graders met their target yeah. and dropped. Yeah, so a you, huge percentage, but it's so, because then Totally yes. So what's confusing, anytime I present cohort data to right. you, I um, step it and color code it stepped. Right. Niwa presents it and I I, I, so I sometimes take this data and put it in like a PowerPoint instead, but I feel like it is helpful to see it directly from Niwa. But again, the charts are off a little bit with, uh, you know, their scale and then they don't step the cohort. So it's a little confusing. Okay. So you look straight across on the row instead of stepping. So. All right, I'm, I'm going to, looking at Mount Vernon's numbers, I can't remember where I saw them now, honestly, but I have, and they were mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. They did phenomenal this year. They did. Um, how can we learn from what they did versus what we did um, in this one? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll jump in on that. That was um, the semester of SAS for oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, this year, so that was a big deal. Uh, the Dean and Leader published article that showed that statewide, uh, just across the state on average, it's like 10 points in math that the children are reading. So they looked at our same numbers, which, which showed a, a, a different curve for those schools and stuff that had just had extra numbers in the year. Um, and so we are looking at that as well, just looking at the numbers that are in the year. And this leads me to my overall question. I won't get into the numbers because there are some that are encouraging and then there are some that are um, less encouraging. And then we have the different factors that we talked about with masks on kindergartners and, and that having a big impact, which I'm glad you said that because I don't know that that has always been appreciated. And I don't wanna get back into this mass debate and bring up the numbers again, but I think it's something that we need to revisit at least for that level um, over the next month and a half, uh, you know, around that first of the year, depending on how things change, if we can't get into the green zone, um, I think we need to revisit that at least for some of these younger kids when, they, when they're doing certain um, reading activities. My question is, maybe it's a two-part question, looking at the results here, uh, did it surprise you in terms of how the results came back? How did it surprise you? And then were they different than your COVID expectations? And has that altered your post, you know, your COVID um, plans for, you know, catching up? That's mm -hmm. really four questions, yeah. but it's two related ones. So hope, tell me if I don't answer all yeah, no, of so it. It's basically, did yeah. the results surprise you? Um, and then have they, has the, have the results altered your post COVID thinking now that everybody's back or most kids are back in school full time now in terms of what we need to do to get kids caught up Are we where we should be or where you thought you'd be, um, you know, what other ways are we trying to make sure that they get caught up to where they need to be? So I was positively surprised by the math. That is the biggest area of concern that, um, what, the national um, test data is showing that students lost more ground in math than they did in reading um, when they were disrupted. So I, I was surprised. I was, uh, you know, um, uh, very pleased that um, most of our grade levels met or exceeded that year's worth of growth from last year to this year. And I, I do want to, um, uh, you know also say that um, you know it was a challenging year last year we had students coming in and out of quarantines um, kids missing chunks of time students um, uh, you know uh, to start the year about 30 percent of our students were virtual last year so this was a tough disrupted year I think that we tend to kind of block it out <laughs> um, because we've been able to make um, some movement ahead with things but it was a really difficult year so to meet target growth in any grade level is what we wanted to help dig us out of that disrupted learning from um, that the spring when we were all remote and shut down. Um, we were hoping we would be able to make that year's worth of growth last year, but last year was a tough year to be able to, to fully make that year's worth of growth. So I was really excited to see in math where um, for the most part we met or exceeded our growth um, at almost every grade level in math. So that was really exciting to me, um, pleasantly um, uh, surprised by that. But um, you know, I don't know that I would make any uh, change in what we're doing in math. We've um, uh, made changes for this year around the materials we're using. We're really focusing deeply on um, making sure that our instruction meets students um, uh, with research-based strategies and where they need to be in um, their learning. Uh, but with reading, I was a little surprised that 
um, not all grade levels met their target growth in reading because for the most part, what um, test data was showing nationally was that most students didn't lose ground in reading during disrupted learning. So why when we were in person or a good chunk of our students were in person, um, you know, why did we not make that um, growth last year? So I wish I could explain why. I, I don't totally know why um, uh, we didn't, but I think it will be really important for us to look at the winter NEWA scores to see um, where we are with that. And as far as, you know, post COVID, you know, definitely looking at winter, continuing to use these individual scores to support students in um, any sort of interventions or enrichment that we can provide to students. Um, and uh, then also this coming spring, I wouldn't expect as many opt outs as we, as we had last year. And we would certainly have a challenge if we did have as many opt outs as we did last year. So hopeful that we'll also be able to see that data and see where our students are if they've caught up enough that they are meeting those grade level expectations. Okay. I would also uh, at least like to get it in the record and I will gladly sit on any committee that wants to discuss this. I think we need to find a better way of handling quarantine for kids. My daughter was a close contact of her sister and uh, because we're household contact, she had to miss 20 days of school in October. So she went to school October 1st and didn't go back until October 25th or 26th. Never had the illness, uh, tested negative five times, I think it was. So for a kindergartner especially to be held out of school for 20 days in the second month of the school year is to me absurd. Um, so I, I would be very happy to see if there's um, any interest anywhere to discuss a better way to handle these for kids at that level to not have to miss 20 days and have test out periods. Because if this is, again, I'm gonna go my cynical self, if it's so contagious for little kids that we have to mask them in all day long, then how did she not catch it? When we tried to get her to catch it, we put them next to each other all the time and she still could not catch that. I think, it's, um, I think that's a strong case for being able to loosen up some of those guidelines and set different policies for our, our district. So I'm just gonna get it out there. We can talk about that off the, offline and um, any committees I will gladly join to discuss this and come up with ideas that make it fruitful for kindergartners who are wearing masks and we've seen the results. Um, to not be missing 20 to 25 days of school in one month. So anything else on, on the NEWA before we move to the last item on the consent agenda that we wanted to talk about? Okay, so the last item was uh, we have a, a handful of policies that were all passed down from the SAU level to this level. And there was one policy that our board voted to approve at the SAU level, but we had further uh, discussion about this regarding policy BHC, which involves board staff communications. Uh, and Victoria, I will, I, I don't want to get into reading the whole policy, but it's essentially how board members have an ethical um, commitment to the board and to their role not to um, get involved in personal discussions with teachers or other staff members of the SAU, allowing them to vent and complain about the school district, any sort of, of official capacity. Um, when that happens, we are instructed to, you know, encourage them to go through the proper chain of commands when they have concerns like this. Um, as opposed to venting to the school board member who might be a neighbor or a friend, a family member, whatever it might be. Um, and there are ethical concerns for the board member, but there's also concerns that a teacher or a staff member could be violating a, a similar policy, either this one or one that the teachers have for an ethics. So Victoria, I wanted to discuss this, and, and I know that it was a, a discussion that we had in length the other night. I don't know that it was um, passed as solidly four to one as, as it might seem. I think it was more of a reluctant four to one. So if you'd like to start, Victoria, we can discuss your concerns and then we can vote to pass this or, or flunk this with, um, you know, with the other policies. Yep, um, so my question or, or my objection to this policy is just the final line um, of the policy. And the final line, um, it just says that therefore discussions of personalities or personal grievances by either party will be considered unethical conduct by the school board member and could cause the staff member to violate this policy. Um, I understand that this policy exists as a staff policy. I understand that there are repercussions and that we should always be ethical. I just think that this line goes a little bit too far. And from the conversation that we were all privy to at the SAU meeting, I think there's debate across um, the SAU. And while we all function as separate boards, I think there's also something to be said about having policies like this consistently supported across all boards. So that's where my where I lie tonight. Ms. Kuzma, would you like to explain the rationale why that line is in there as you were on the policy committee? 
Yeah. <clears throat> so this policy went to the SAU, got bounced back to policy. We discussed, so the policy committee discussed again. Um, and as part of the discussions, we had talked about removing that line and the merit behind it. And in general, as, the, as a committee, it was decided that although this policy, although we could very easily remove this policy, it doesn't change that it's fact. Um, so it was felt that keeping this in um, made it explicit for everybody what the potential repercussions are. Um, it says that it could cause. Um, so, you know, really the general feeling was it's better for everybody. You know, this is a board policy. So making sure board members are aware of what the repercussions of their actions are and that it is their responsibility to prevent staff members, um, to stop staff members when they start the discussion and making sure they're following proper protocols. Um, this line could very easily be removed, but it doesn't change the fact that it is still fact. Um, this policy does exist in all of our surrounding districts, so it's not unique to us. Um, some wording was changed to actually make it a little bit more clear that this is a board member policy. This is a board policy. Um, and there is a corresponding staff policy that states the same. Thank you. And I think it's worth noting that um, a lot of these policies have a chain of consequences that are involved in them if you have other violations and other policies. So I don't think that this is inconsistent with that. Um, while this doesn't lay out specific violations for ethical conduct, I think it does highlight the fact that there are, you know, that there will be consequences if something is done unethically. So I don't necessarily have a problem with this um, as written because I think without that, it, it takes away those, um, that set of consequences, which, you know, exist in other policies. So any other thoughts? Okay. So as of right now, I have a motion to accept the consent agenda as written. Uh, do I, and we had that seconded motion. We'll take a vote to pass the consent agenda as written. And Terry, I will start with you. Oh, no, we don't, correct. I'm so used to doing the roll calls. So all in favor of passing the consent agenda as written. Four, against? Victoria and non abstain. So it passes four to one as written. So now, as we move along, I, I do appreciate everyone's patience. I know that our agenda does not line up with our timing tonight, which um, gives me anxiety, even though it's my own fault. Um, I will turn it over to uh, Assistant Superintendent Steve Chamberlain to discuss a, uh, a program potentially being installed at the middle school for out of school suspensions. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, just some background, uh, earlier in the summer, um, the Dean of Students, John Barry, and I, and Mike, and everyone worked on a program that I had implemented both as an assistant principal, actually as assistant principal, principal, and superintendent in my previous district. The notion really is how do you, how do you care for youngsters who are going through struggling times? And, and what, the, what the program outlines is and there are times when, based on, on, on certain violations of, of conduct and expectations, that separating youngsters from our schools is necessary. And, and then how do you do that? And can you do that in a caring, supportive way, uh, recognizing that this is a struggling youngster? Uh, so what the proposal is, is to create a supervised out-of-school suspension, pro uh, suspension program. It, it does fulfill the need to sometimes remove a youngster from the school population for a variety of reasons in the judgment of, of Bethany and, and John. Uh, and then uh, the program, um, and, and what's happened so far is we have uh, procured the fire station, the community room would be the location of this program. We've met. With, with the fire station staff and be a wonderful location. Uh, typically the day would be about three hours of academic support, uh, some time for lunch and three hours of community retribution. It could very, very well be polishing fire, fire apparatus, which we think is a good thing. Now we see their reasoning. And things like that. Um, so really, the, so um, with the schedule, if a youngster is out for two or three or four days, it's sometimes if they're at home, either the parents have to take time off from work or if the youngsters are at home, typically that individual work would be online or gaming or things like that, and really not a productive use of that time. And so by providing a supervised opportunity for youngsters, um, they stay current in academic work. And the return, uh, if a youngster is behind on you know, return from a multiple day suspension, that feeling of desperation sometimes manifests itself in additional behavior. 
So what we're trying to do is on uh, uh, connect with the youngster while they're there. So typically, the assistant principal, in this case, uh, uh, John, would go and, and check in with the youngster during the day. Um, we have connect, uh, communication with the mentor, um, who would either supervise the youngster during the day, a connection with the school. Uh, sometimes uh, school counselors would go and see them during the day, depending on the interaction, depending on where they're at. So it's an opportunity to provide supports, opportunity to provide academic support, and then on board them and on ramp them back into school. And frankly, the notion of a pilot is to see how this type of program integrates into the community. Data would be tracked. Um, one of the one of the uh, data pieces that we found in my in my previous district was recidivism rates would decrease um, with the youngsters uh, and find and. and and uh, Adam has talked about the importance of positive or anchoring adults, but this program provides additional time for an, uh, another supportive adult. And there is some training involved on how to, to work with youngsters who, who are, uh, have committed an infraction that was required them to separate from school. So there's some training uh, about those boundaries and how to support the youngsters. But really it is trying to provide a double dose of care for youngsters and families who are going through some difficult times, doing everything we can to support them during this time and provide them for the opportunity for success as they re-enter um, back into the school. Um, Bethany and I have spoke about this. There has been, uh, uh, I, I do think there's some opportunities for this, and really we rely on the judgment of Bethany and John. Um, tip, is, is it probably more typical a 7 through 12 program? Probably, but I rely on Bethany's judgment and John's. They know the students really well, and, and, and they would determine whether or not that student would be a candidate for this program um, based on where they are and, and based on uh, you know, a, an evaluation of their current state, and the same thing with, with John up here. Uh, one thing is your, your building administrators know the kids extremely well. Um, they really do want to do the very best they can to care for the youngsters going through these times, and I truly believe that having students connected with school adults during this time, as opposed to independent and, and putting a burden on a family, I really do think it's best practice. I really think it's a parent hack. Um, so the hope would be that uh, right now, um, we are um, working on selection of mentors. We have just about every job description is in place, locations in place, doing some um, mentor collection, making sure they are all background checked because they would be alone with youngsters. Um, uh, in a, but a very public, uh, if you've been in the community room, it's a, semi it's a perfect location because it's semi-private, semi-public, um, which is really the perfect design for, for a program like this. Uh, hoping, oh, actually, we hope we don't have any takers, any business, but if we do have some business, we hope to have the infrastructure in place soon and then track data, track recidivism, uh, and, and really, and, and get some feedback from families. Um, the connections made during these programs at times it is really another asset, and, and typically families truly appreciate this kind of approach. Um, I appreciate Bethany's always desire, want to do best for kids, um, and really double dose youngsters who really struggle. And, and some of our, we meet often, and some of our discussions on how do we support youngsters who are struggling. And then we think this is a way that we can provide additional resources and reduce the struggle and provide some support. So I appreciate the opportunity. And, and Bethany and I and John have had discussions about this. And I turn it over to her. But that's, that's where we're coming from. How do we care about kids who are struggling? So just a, before we open it up for more in-depth questions, this is a pilot, a program that's being piloted at the high school right now, correctly? Correct. correct? We are still, we are, um, our, our is it, it say, is it in full implementation at the high school we, yet or still yeah, setting it up? We, correct. We um, are waiting for background checks to be completed. That's the status. We have mentors, and uh, it is obviously very significant in a situation like this that we have all the support in place. So we are in the returning of background check phase. Questions? Um, okay, so right now this is a high school program. The person would be higher, well, kind of a sub through the high school. Would you be signing into this program if you're part of the? So it would it would be a separate. It would be a similar structure, but uh, the, the pay for the day would come from the AMS. Okay, so it would be a separate person for the AMS. Well, it's on call, so we'd have a list of the same training. So we'd have like five people on call. Are you available tomorrow? We've got a client, and if it's an AMS student, we would uh, the, the bill would come with AMS, and they've got a staff meeting at the end of the day. So that's on call. But the mentor could actually be the same. Mentors are hired by the district. Correct. Background check, and then they just respond to whatever the district. Yeah, they're on call. Were to execute that. So if we have 
three spread between the two buildings. Well, we're gonna get for as many as we can. So we can have, we would have, it'd be, it'd be a one time. Well, it's just a, right, it's just correct. Uh, if, if uh, depending on the situation, uh, you, I, I do envision that AMS population is separate from SHS population, but it is possible for an AMS person to speak and an SHS person to speak in the same time, depending on the situation and depending on the circumstances. It is conceivable that one mentor could support, supervise a more than one student. It's a excellent, it's a, it's, I don't, it's a wonderful thing. Okay. I, I took a very long time. I apologize. No, that's okay. It's great. <laughs> Um, so first, I'd like to thank you for the language that you're using, and I and I like that you're really looking at it as obviously something is not going right if you're acting out in a way that you can't be in your school population, and it may be coming from home. Maybe there's so many reasons behind it, and saying you know what I just can't with you right now is not the way to go. And that's really, for the safety of everybody else, it's been the only option we've had. And so I, I like this to saying something is not working and you're hurting, so how do we help that hurt rather than just because there need to be consequences, and I agree with that. Consequences, so I like that you also have built in that is like, okay, we're keeping you up to date, but you still have to do stuff that's probably not fun, <laughs> like, like maybe polishing fire equipment, like, you know, there's still that concept of a consequence. So I think it's, it's a nice balance. But I really like the, um, the thought that we really are trying to support these families that they themselves might be at the end of their rope and like, I don't know what to do either. And do we have any extra supports that we're giving like to families? Maybe um, you know, our guidance counselors talking with them are, because it feels like it really does need to be both sides to be truly successful. No, it's it's a great idea. Can we afford it? Uh, um, we did look <laughs> the um, protection that we come from. It, it comes out it typically comes out sub account from the ones around where they work for the sub. Um, we will track the days, um, but it, it would it, there's enough day that there's a reason why this is built in. Okay. Um, it doesn't end the day, so hopefully over time we can kind of keep it on keep that but we agree that it's a protection of value and the return is Thank you. Story. It's almost like Terry knew what to say as she led into my question. Um, so daily rate, we're talking about substitute rates, yep. I think I've heard you say. Cost of training, what, what would this person need to, how would this person need to be trained? I know that our substitutes are not given as rigorous of training as our other uh, staff members. I would wanna make sure that the time is not just a caring adult, but is a caring adult who is, you know, yeah, equipped. Helpful. Equipped. <laughs> just I expect mm -hmm. to be in training myself to get them on the exact same thing that I expect to get on. I, I think that formal training is maybe a different responsibility than just training them on what they already know. Okay. Um, we're looking for mentors and guidance for that. The, the model is for us to keep them as long as possible. And then when we can put them on the fly, Um, without getting into specific students, obviously, how many students throughout a year do you think would be clients of this program? If we went back in the last three months, um, we probably would have about 20 or 25. So it's about a quarter of a year. It, it, honestly, it's hard. It varies tremendously year to year. Um, An out-of-school suspension is not something that we issue lightly. Um, it's typically for um, it's typically for an offense that has risen to such a level again that um, in order for student safety, the student cannot be in the building. Um, this year, I think that's probably accurate number of days. Um, in in past years, it's been far less. So 
it, it really is a case by case basis. Um, but you know, as Steve said, out of school suspension on its own doesn't solve a problem. There's a reason that we've gotten to that point, and this program really helps to get to the root of that and create more connections so that we don't, that the goal and the hope would be that we don't have repeats. Sure. And then your, the step that's prior to this for slightly less serious infractions is your in-school suspension? Yes. And okay. we're also looking at redesigning that. Um, that already has the consequence. It's a yes and. So there's a consequence and there's a therapeutic piece to it as well. The two have to go hand in hand. Um, and that involves um, our school resource officer, our guidance counselors, our school psych, really our whole, um, we call it our Eagle support team, really involves all of those pieces of, of trying to address both. Um, and that's the value of that. Typically in an out of school suspension now, the extent that we're able to do is a re-entry meeting with families and those folks that are involved. This would take that to the next level so that it's not just a re-entry, but it's a whole program along the way. And do you find that um, the students who would be eligible for this out of school, most out of school suspensions are already in connection with your Eagle support team? So that these students are getting those same, those same supports? You mean prior to them rising to this level? Mm -hmm. Not always. Often, okay. not always. Okay. That was going to be my question is what is being, I know this is a recidivism issue, so we're trying to reduce that on the back end of it, but at this point, the cat's already, the cow's already out of the barn. What are we trying to do to keep the cow in the barn at this point um, to try to prevent that from happening and, and needing these resources? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. I, this is all a continuum of risk, and sometimes kids make the, I mean, the, the definition. Kids are kids. Right, the definition of teenager is I made a mistake and learned from it, right? Um, as we hope. And, uh, the reality is that some mistakes are egregious enough that there is no in between step. You know, there are some times where a five day out of school suspension is the minimum standard for a particular infraction. There are some that are much higher than that. You know, that, that we have to be held to some of the others. So, AMS in particular cares for kids well. They, you know, they show the extra mile that they're in contact and relationship and support uh, for students. They will know, they make sure every single kid in the building will make sure there's at least one contact between the adult and a positive relationship with the Single student to make sure there's no gap there. So this is, uh, you know, this is while this is the end of the line in terms of discipline, almost, right? This is beyond out of school suspension, um, but uh, this is a, a much better way to, to move it out because whenever we out of school suspend a kid, we always worry that this kid is not going to be even further behind and even more likely to fall into the wrong group than we thought. So this is quite frankly. I'll include in my next board report some of the changes and some of the pieces we have in place and have really, really upped our game this year and some of that proactive work. Great. There's more I think more work to do to expand the code of justice as far as what these programs can look like. It's really exciting though. Um, and this is our step, but I think we'll see over the next year or so the expansion of the code of justice system to help students um, to make sure that this is a learning experience. I like about it at school, we are learning, but we're on the learning of behavior content. And I think the things we can do with the restorative justice area to help support them, um, and to Adam Bruce's point, I think we're, we're really changing that. Just to make sure I'm aware, that means there's a soldier. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sure they're both going to school. <laughs> Anything, uh, I'll give the best last word. So, what, Measures do we have in place to make sure the kids actually show up? And we don't have a staff member show up for nothing. Sure. Um, well, so there's a, a, a very much of a written letter explaining what happens if you don't participate. Oh, okay. and, and typically, it's not a great answer, but it typically is a double. It's not the most favorite thing, but once they hear that, um, actually, most families love that. Because they don't have to take a day off from work. They get the youngsters having academic support. Um, the only time it's a struggle is they can't get the youngster there. They just physically can't get the youngster there. And if they can't get the youngster there, that youngster's not ready. And they put them in. And that doesn't mean they have to be smiling walking through the door. Um, but uh, you know, 
I've never, in, in 20 years, um, a parent never complained about this. I, I think it's a great way to solve this issue and to handle it. It's, it's a much more educational experience yeah. um, on many levels. So I think it's genius. <laughs> that's, our, that's our hope. Uh, education, every aspect of our operation, including the fun stuff with the little kids in Israel. But that's kind of what we like to do. After they're done with the fire trucks, I have some leaves that can be blown in my yard. I live right around the corners. So. All over it. Yep. All over it. Uh, moving on then to our final item before budget talk tonight, uh, an update from the Joint Facilities Advisory Committee, and I will turn it over to Victoria for that. Hello. I, I almost forgot this was next up on the agenda. Um, <laughs> no, I, I knew it was coming. Um, so Joint Facilities Advisory Committee, we all know this is about our school building project. Um, I feel as though I'm, I'm speaking to all of you, probably giving you information that you already are aware of, um, but just making sure that everybody's kind of on the same page. So since our last Amherst School Board meeting, thank you, Terry. Since our last Amherst School Board meeting, um, we've cont continued to hold our monthly community forums. Um, we are alternating between locating ourselves over at Wilkins and then over at AMS. Um, not to be missed is Clark and the fact that our Clark Elementary School is also busting at the seams and has multiple uh, multiple issues over in that building that, that's why we're putting everybody together. Um, the updated website is also um, always up to date as every time we have a public forum, we have some new information that new information is always available for people. At the Halloween doors on the green that the uh, Rec Commission hosted, we had a booth and we handed out information um, the same way that we did at the Clark Wilkins Booster Fun Run. So we're handing out a small flyer um, to, any, to anybody who will take them, um, just that directs people to the public forums and directs people to the website so that everybody can be informed, have the same facts, ask the same questions. The website allows people to submit questions both anonymously and not. Um, so we feel that that's a very important um, place to direct our, all of our residents here in town. Um, I want the board to know that while you have seen floor plans, you can expect some exterior conceptual designs by December. So we're very excited to bring that to the table so that people will be able to have an idea when you're standing on the road what it actually looks like. Um, it's an important, important piece to the puzzle for everyone to be able to visualize. Um, something else I wanted to talk about is the cost. So I, I have here a binder. This binder is going to go find its home at the Amherst Town Library. And the purpose of the binder is to have printouts of all of the different, um, um, like our slide deck and other facts so that people who are not accessing the internet or people who are just looking for something to be able to touch and flip through, um, we'll be able to have all that information. So that is what is in here. Something that I think is important um, to touch upon is at our last meeting, we had given support for the $83 million project for the combined Clark Wilkins, um, Clark Wilkins building and the AMS renovation. The numbers are split 52.2 million for Clark Wilkins and 30.8 million for AMS for the renovation there. Um, the AMS renovation includes the energy efficient HVAC systems, site work redesign, and a secure entrance addition. And the Clark Wilkins building includes energy efficient HVAC systems, um, as well as obviously it's a brand new building, but that was an, an upgrade that I thought was important to include for all of you. Um, I would like to suggest that as a board, we kind of take a formal stance on that 83 million so that we know and we can project to the community that this is the number so that people know that's where we're going forward. Um, I recognize that we won't have necessarily we won't have the wording that would appear on the ballot as a Warren article. Um, but I think at our last meeting we supported it, but I just want to I think it would help JFAC and it would help the community to know that this is the number and it will not be changing before the vote. Um, so that's something that I would like to discuss at some point. If I'm not mistaken, we did vote on that last time I thought. I, thought we did too. We voted I think we voted to support it. We can't vote on that number yet because we don't have the wording for the warrant article. So I don't know that we can actually vote that 83 million is the final number because if it's 83.1 that we find out, we have a 
$100,000 speed bump that we have to put in there and it has to be part of this, then I think it's premature to vote, you know, on official warrant language. But we supported the $83 million when this was brought up in September, I think it was, wasn't it? I distinctly remember... Um, so I think the I think the important thing to note here is that um, the amount that we put forth on the ballot is our high watermark. We will not be spending more money than that on this project. We don't want to have to go back to the taxpayers and get more money. We're conservatively uh, conservatively high in this 83 million, um, but also knowing that if the number comes in lower, that that money, the pledge of the board is to return that money to taxpayers. Um, we had talked at, at the last meeting, at our JFAC meeting, when it was 82 point, I believe it was 82.6 million, and then we had discussed rounding it to the 83 million, um, and the understanding that rounding it for it to be a nice whole number makes a lot of sense, but also the importance of everyone understanding that 82.6 versus 83, that's $400,000 that will be returned to taxpayers if we don't end up meeting it, which we you know, according to our numbers, probably won't, and we probably will be lower than that 82.6 anyway. Tom, if you have, like, so I have the motion that we, that we made in our, I uh, have to check the, from October 7th, it was Ms. Kuzma motion to recommend the amount of 83 million for the Clark Wilkins and MS facility projects and wait for bond council for solar. Uh, where we stand with that right now is, is we're waiting just for more information on that. Uh, but it continues, Ms. Beam, second of the motion, it was unanimous five to nothing. Okay, so so we are good as a board to say that this is our number and we are moving forward with it. I just wanted to confirm that before. Yep, I know. As, as far as I, unless somebody else is, wants to do another vote again tonight, but I think that this covers it, and I think that we're we're set on the eighty-three million. I personally don't want to go higher than that. So I mean, I, you'd get a no for me if you went higher than eighty-three. <laughs> I think the concern a little bit is as long as the board is at a consensus that that motion means that we will actually be putting it on the warrant, like on the ballot and not a, oh no, we like the 83 and the next month we're looking at all of the warrant article language and we're like, oh, but we're not gonna do that. So I think that that is where, as long as the board is under the consensus that that motion means we're putting this on the ballot, obviously we don't have the war ballot language, um, but as long as, I, I think that's what every, I think that's what JFAC wants to know. I, I think it would also be helpful from a ways and means perspective Yes. to be able to say at this date in November, this is the intent of the Amherst School Board without question to put this on the ballot so that it's not something that is possibly changed because there is in a month or two. A little bit of a question on that. Yeah. Thank you. Also, building on what Victoria said, it uh, might be appropriate for the board to weigh in on the solar as well, and whether, whether the board is interested in pursuing that as a separate amendment or not. I think we were waiting for more information on that still as of my update with Shannon as of uh, the night of our forum. What was it, Monday night, Tuesday night this week? They all blended in Monday night. So we were still waiting on more information for that, which I thought we would discuss in December when we had that. Yep, so at this point, JFAC has, su has um, suggested that the Amherst School Board put it on as a so separate Warren article. And it's now kind of the charge of the Amherst School Board to determine if that will go on as a separate Warren article. My question would be if um, if the board wants further, um, I don't know, a memo or directive from our administration, if we need to ask for that specifically so that we have all that information to be able to make that determination in December. Yeah, I think looking at exactly. the size of the project, the investment for the project, the kilowatt hours returning, what the cost savings are going to be, I think we, I, mean, I think it's premature for us to vote on saying we're going to put this as a warrant article when we don't have any idea what that information is going to be yet. No, and I agree with you on that. Yeah. Those things that you just listed, I want to make sure that we have Adam or Roger knowing that those are the, the things that we want to hear back on. Um, so that we have that information to be able to do that in December. I'm not saying that we should do anything with solar right now, other than making sure that they know the questions that we want the answers to. And at the forum on Monday, I did talk to Shannon about that because I had the same question um, that they recommended it, but the board hadn't discussed it. So we are waiting for more information on that. Yep. So important to, to yep. make known to the public as we sit here. The lifespan of the panels is an important piece of information to know. Because if they're only good for five years, I mean, they're good for longer, but. <laughs> and the lifespan of the sun as well. Without that, they're not very good. <laughs> Anything else, Victoria? Yep, I've got a couple more things. 
Um, if my memory serves correctly from last year, the deadline to apply for state aid comes up in January. Um, and so I would, I would think that it's important, no matter how small our chances of receiving state aid based on certain qualifications, um, but I would think that it's important. Amy, do you have, yeah, so have any the thoughts? The deadline to apply is not January. The deadline to submit a, a letter of intent is January. Um, the application is due in July. Okay. I'm unclear if our project aligns with the timeline of this round. So I have a call into um, Amy Clark at the DOE to um, have a discussion about that. Great. And I would assume from other board members that it's important that if it does align with anything yeah. that we can receive state funding that we would pursue that? Of course. Yeah. Okay. Just just throwing yeah, it out there. don't want her trust your money. Yeah, we will take our money. <laughs> just throwing it out there to make sure that I'm not speaking for myself. Um, and finally, we are in the stage of community sharing and the importance of getting this project and the information out to the voters and the residents. So this will be um, the next couple months you will hear from me as the JFAC vice chair, asking you as school board members to be uh, knowledgeable about the project and willing to share your knowledge with anybody who is looking for information as, um, as we get closer. So any questions? I'm happy to take questions. Sorry. I'm getting better at this, okay. So I would just like to point out that when you're saying that the 83 is a high water mark and that we would return the money, in fact, it's not like our regular budget, we would never take that money to begin with. Correct. So we wouldn't take it and then give it back. We just wouldn't take the bond out for all of it if we didn't need it all. That's my understanding, so I just wanna have that clarified for me. Uh, actually, it'll be a board decision how that's handled. So uh, some, uh, in a lot of it will do deal with timing of interest rates at the time. Okay. So for example, if we believe interest rates are rising very quickly, it would be in our best interest, I guess that's a literal phrase in that case, <laughs> to sell the bond right away so we'd have the lowest interest rate possible because rates are rising. We don't want to wait later to borrow money and then pay a higher, higher interest rate. Um, if interest rates are stable or decreasing, we could sell bonds multiple times when we need to pay bills along the way. So we could be dancing at the lowest possible rates. So in either scenario, if we borrowed more than we need, we could simply return it to offset a future tax rate that would go back to voters. That's not great if that number is $10 million, because when we borrowed $10 million more that we right. have interest on, even though we got a one-time total on tax rate. So we would try to avoid that and be as close as possible, but we'd err on the side of selling a little more because interest rates are rising. And the other scenario, we just wouldn't borrow all that we said we were going to borrow. Okay, so I, I mostly understood. <laughs> well, here's what's unique about this, different than our budget. This is an example of a situation where we say, this is the amount we're going to borrow, how much it's going to cost taxpayers, and at what in what years it will cost taxpayers is not determined until the board sells the bond after the vote. Okay. So it's literally not, the board would be authorized to sell only 10 years worth of bonds or up to 30. So any, and anywhere in between and whatever interest rates of the day the bonds are sold. And so that's the reason why, one of the reasons why it requires a three-fifths majority vote to pass. Because you're giving school, the voters are giving the school board authority to borrow on their behalf at terms that cannot be set prior to the, the voters approving it. Right. But the one thing we do know is that we would never be able to do more than than whatever is on the warrant article. So that part is the set in stone, that no matter what. One other interesting side note about that is, say uh, the vote passed and the next day we sold $83 million in bonds. It doesn't happen that fast, but say we did. We wouldn't need to pay out $83 million in bills to the construction companies, the architects, et cetera, for a period of time. That money would sit as cash in our bank account and then go to the school. And so there'd be actually, if the voters, if the article is written in a certain way, we could expend that interest money earned as well for the help of the project if we needed it, which in turn could offset how much we have to borrow down the road if we didn't sell the full bond. You right. know what I'm saying? Because it's called arbitrage. But the point is we, we have options that work in the taxpayer's best interest. Thanks. I always learn something when I come. Which is important for everybody to know that we are thinking about those things and we do have those that knowledge um, in the background. Um. I just wanted to give a quick plug to the next 
public forum, which is on December 9th at 6.30 at Wilkins in the MPR. Um, and just make sure everybody in the public and the board was aware. Um, we actually um, had Zoom going this time. We did last time, but um, we were monitoring Zoom, making sure that things were going well. You know, like the video, they were having issues hearing a little bit. So the link was shared to everybody watching. Um, and we allowed for people on that were, had dialed in through Zoom to actually, um, we opened up Q&A for them. So that is the plan to continue. Yes. So we took we took the model of the board of selectmen and decided that that was very helpful that they have uh, the Zoom option available for those who are not attending in person. Okay. Uh, before we move on to our final item for the night with the budget, I do want to take one step back and uh, we I should have taken a motion and a vote on the out of school suspension um, program. So before we go to the budget, I will take a motion to allow uh, Amherst Middle School and the SAU to adopt an out of school suspension pilot program for the duration of the 2021-2022 school year. Terry will make the motion. Beth will second it. All in favor? Five. Anybody against? None. So that business done. Now let's go to the budget for the night. Uh, and I will start off tonight. We have members of the Ways and Means Committee here. We'll let them uh, come up and make their presentation first, uh, their thoughts on the budget process to this far, uh, and give us their notes on that before we proceed into our conversation. Kelly? Hi, I know you all, but um, I'll just state my name for the public um, who might be uh, listening. Um, Kelly Schmidt, I'm the Ways and Means uh, Committee Chair. And um, this re um, report is essentially, uh, as I, you know, goes away on my phone, um, the thoughts of the entire committee um, putting together uh, to come back to you uh, with our ideas. So Ways and Means is pleased that the original uh, superintendent's proposed budget, which started at a 4.8% increase over fiscal years uh, 22's budget, has been reduced to uh, a 3.1% increase through diligent discussion, consideration, and revised inputs. So we're very you know, pleased that you, you guys have already done that work and fully approved those pieces and know that you're continuing to work on um, discussions going forward. However, the overall starting point comes across as a wish list without specific priorities priorities standing out. Um, the detailed discussions brought to light that portions of this budget, including the middle school chairs and technology spending, are true needs that have piled up from continued deferment and lack of long-term plans, not specifically related to any of you know, the years any of you have been on the board, but um, over you know, long, long periods of time. Um, Individual departments have started to create those plans, and it is evident that it will assist in preventing those issues going forward. So we pretty much are applauding you for um, all that, that work and, and know that it, it really will help um, in the future. Um, however, administrative staffing feels heavy, and we recognize that there is continued plans for growth. And by administrative, we're talking um, about some of the domain leads and other things. We're not talking specifically just you know, office administrative, but all, all aspects um, that is you know, not specific teachers. teachers. Um, we feel that more evidence is needed to support um, that approach um, that would add, that would let us know that there is tangible value for students and taxpayers to have that heavier set um, compared to a lot of other school districts. So um, I, that's, that's pretty much, um, I don't know if you guys have any questions, but um, you know, we're, we like the work that, that you're doing. Um, we'd like to continue to see it come down and we'd like to continue to have you know, justifications for um, the items that you're putting, putting in. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Kelly before she leaves? Victoria? Hello, Kelly. Um, 
when it comes to the administrative positions um, and asking for tangible value of those positions, um, would it be in line to ask the Ways and Means Committee to give us possibly a list of what positions you're discussing so that we would be able to make sure that we can tie it to some tangible value that it does bring forth to the students? Sure, we can try and do that. Um, one of the aspects that we, we talked about is that you know, it's really great that we have things like the NEWA scores and the SAS scores and we can say, okay, here's math, here's, you know, um, reading and stuff like that. But what we really don't have is any metrics or values that tell us about um, some of the, uh, I hate to say it, but soft um, skills or things that we're adding by having a lot of these positions. You know, a lot of the, like the, the new program you're talking about for middle school and high school um, with uh, uh, the out of school suspension. Okay, that's gonna add small piece to the budget, which you hope gets a return of you know some kind out there. And we have a ton of programs like that, but we really don't have any sort of valuation or metrics that is available out there for the community to see that, hey, we're, are the money that we're putting in, so many of the pieces go to complete full rounded students and we're getting great value in that area. Um, and I'm just, you know, I'm making the assumption that that's the purpose of those. And we'd like to just have feedback that says, yeah, that's what we're trying to get to. You know, whether we do succeed in those goals or not is it might be another story, but those are the purpose for having these things in place and here's what we're trying to show it go to and you know then if we can over time determine hey it's not really happening okay then you reconsider and stuff like that but i don't think we have any basis to reconsider on to consider going forward so, so it sounds like some reports being available would would help yeah i mean i don't know value. like as a board member how you guys even evaluate anything that isn't you know stuff that's me and stuff like that how how are you doing that right now are you that's all adam yeah so thank you uh, for that it, it's actually uh, great feedback so uh, uh um ironically another board that represents sc39 which we cannot do they meet in the same room and the building is named after their board um <laughs> they uh raise similar questions and concerns about the budget and upon thinking about it i realized but that really was my fault because I, in this budget process, hadn't laid out why we're doing what we're doing and how it then translates into the budget. So we have the strategic vision that we've talked about for a couple of years. Our board has supported it. Uh, Ways and Means Advisory Finance Committee want to see a connection to what you're doing strategically to what you're asking for in terms of money and how you're prioritizing your funding requests. And so uh, I spent this past weekend working on putting together just that presentation. Um, I did present it last night, I don't know what day that was, last night or the night before to the Sohegan Advisory Finance Committee and, and uh, the Sohegan School Board at their budget workshop and it lays out, this is, this is what we're doing, these are the things that tie to money because some things don't. Our individual uh, individualized student plan pilot doesn't have a financial impact, mm -hmm. but it's listed as still a priority even though it doesn't tie to budget. So I went through that whole presentation and laid out, this is what we're doing and why we're doing it and here are the data that support why we need to do what we're requesting. So uh, I'd be happy to come to Ways and Means. Uh, I think the, I'm going to be presenting that to the SAU board um, as a whole, because it ties all of us together in a lot of ways. Uh, but I'm happy to have that conversation. And uh, part of the, my reflection is people like the advisory, the Ways and Means, they see the result of all of our effort, work, and thought process. And then have to try to like reverse engineer, why, why are they, how did they get to this point? And uh, really what I'm going to try to do through that presentation is show, here's what we see as, as problems and challenges. Here's what we're already working on. Here are the priorities that we need to focus on to improve the things that we're concerned about. And then here are the things that actually affect the budget and why we budgeted things the way we have. And then I would take that the next step of, is there anything that we can measure that says- It's successful. That it was successful, yeah. Correct, that's part of the, part of the data yeah. that informs what the problem is should be the data that's Six. approved yep. as a result of the intervention. So uh, so shame on me for not having this out in front of the budget process and uh, kind of- I don't think it's traditionally been part of it 
to historically, so I, I don't, we don't necessarily, or I personally don't necessarily fault you for that, but I think it is something that, you know, as time has gone on, we've seen is, would be great value to the taxpayers to understand what they're paying for. Yeah, and uh, I will communicate it and make recommendations. That's my job as superintendent to say, here are the things I think that are priorities of the community and as reflected by our board's individual goals and the boards that, the goals that have been set by our boards. Here, here's my professional judgment of how you make those things better and what it costs to do that. And then you folks can process and decide whether you agree or not. Great, well thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, before we continue on, I would like to turn it over to Amy Facey. Uh, we have a uh, laundry list of items that were um, under the proposed changes tab uh, that we came into the day, or came into the week, I should say, looking at a savings of about 386000 And now that number has been cut in half by some changes that are um, a variety of changes. I'll leave it at that. And if you want to walk us through those to explain it, um, that would be helpful. Yes, unfortunately, the budget has evolved or devolved in the wrong direction. Um, but first, just a, a few smaller items. There were some minor changes to some software. Um, some Zoom licenses were omitted in error. Um, there was a few changes to the default where there were some benefit items that were not included in the default that should have been. Um, so those are relatively minor. I'll skip down to the bottom of the list. Also, a few other minor things. Yes, yep. yep. All the yellow. So I went all the way to the bottom um, to the repair and maintenance for the middle school, repair and maintenance line item for elementary. The um, At the suggestion of Um, to our kitchen staff is requesting a knife sharpening service um, as a safety item. So it's a small amount for each of the schools, $500. Um, they're also requesting slip-resistant shoes um, as a safety item. So that's uh, $300 for each of the schools. So back to the larger issue. Um, so in the ASSA agreement, there is a clause that if 22 or more uh, employees are eligible for the health insurance buyout, then the amount paid to each employee for that buyout will increase from $1,000 to $5,000 for each subsequent school year and, uh, for full time and prorated for part time. So that happened this year. <laughs> and that is in the ASSA current agreement, correct, Amy? Yes. yes. So we had originally budgeted um, for these folks at 1000 and we needed to increase that payout to 5000 along with the associated um, benefit line items that go with that. So I was just notified by the business office that we uh, surpassed that threshold. Just to note that if we get to 31 employees participating, then that increases to 7,500. But we're not there yet. We're at 27 um, for next year. Well, they're they're not taking the health insurance. So yes, so that you know it's cheaper. The health insurance cost. Correct. The the issue is it's a budget decrease for this year. Um, because we were projecting 1,000 as opposed to 5,000. But yes, they're not taking health insurance, so that is a big increase. Um, so yes, I believe it's in perpetuity, as it was explained to me. So if it goes back down to 15 next year, then they still get the 5,000? OK. Yes. Now we just gave them an idea. Shoot. Yep. So that that is. Kidding almost all of the line items because each each person who receives that there's multiple lines that go with that so it looks it looks far scarier than it is 
Um, Can I ask you just a quick question on yeah. that, Amy? I, I don't want to derail your no, while you okay. give this information. So if they were, if we were below, what was the number, 20 or 21? It's 22. It's 22. So if we were below, we were had to have been below 22, I would imagine, if we were budgeting, say, 22,000 for this. So if we now have, if we're over that number, shouldn't there be a reflective cost savings of the four additional ones that went from accepting health insurance to not accepting it? Shouldn't there have been an offsetting reduction in their overall health care costs somewhere in the budget? Yeah, there was one. So, yeah, this. Newer, that, there you go. That was the, I was so the, slowly there is coming. There's one in here that I had budgeted for health insurance that I backed down. I saw that one. I didn't know if there were um, yeah. additional ones. Okay, thank you. So um, then the other item is I was just recently informed that, um, and I may turn to Anna or Kathleen to elaborate on this, but that we've had, as you know, we've had an uh, increase in students requiring special services. And um, based on that population, the scale has been tipped where we need to hire a new special education teacher this year. Uh, and therefore, that position needs to be budgeted for next year. So I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, Anna. Yeah, I think um, uh, currently, with as we talked about at one of our last budget meetings with the influx of uh, students this year with special needs, um, uh, that their IEPs and services, uh, just in one grade alone, was 12 students that, that joined this year, that um, in order to meet the IEP requirements and services, um, that we need the special education teacher this year. That, that would, because it's, it's required um, legally. But this has happened in the past before where we where, where we have qualified for grant funding and it's been that's been able to to subsidize it for at least a year or two. So I know we had a position that started this year on our budget that was covered for the last two years, I believe. Is that not an option this year? It will be covered by the grant right now. This this position but no additional years after that? Not that's not my understanding. Yeah. Because then it's a known okay. need. The supplement that assists the plan this year. Okay. So those are the changes. Um, and also, you'll see down at the bottom, um, we've discussed the need to add some, um, some funds for fuel for the buses, given the rising uh, costs in gasoline. Uh, this year, we've actually already been uh, hit with some additional costs because we've the, the cost of fuel has surpassed the fuel cap of $2.57 that's in the bus contract. So we're keeping track of those. But we did have some small costs for um, the field trip, about $71. and. August it was about $45, September almost $900, and October about $1,500. So we want to make sure that we put some funds in the budget to, to cover those. Um, so I'm working on a projection for all the districts um, to be able to apportion that out appropriately. And then finally, the what we were just talking about, the uh, performing arts domain lead salary. Um, that needs to be a discussion and decision by the board on um, accepting that or not and putting it on the budget. Okay. Any other direct questions for Amy or any other talking points that anybody wants to bring up with the items that are uh, on the table in that column or in that uh, list? Um, the slip resistant shoes. Um, I get the purpose of them. Is there a reason that they're not supplying them themselves? Because do we really want, you know, if one staff member leaves and then another one starts, they're not going to be the same shoe size necessarily, and they're going to so be So they're $50 shared. a pair. So it, it was a recommendation that we provide them for our, for our staff. And they stay with us if the person leaves. 
I right. I know that's. I wouldn't think they would. It's kind of. And it's and it's out of the food service budget as well. I feel. So I think I think um, I have a I have an issue with that because I've worked at jobs where you've needed slip resistant shoes, uh, making you know seven twenty five an hour, and they did not provide them for me. Um, so I would prefer that we um, exclude those from that because there's no guarantee that these shoes aren't going to be worn outside of the school. There's no guarantee that they're going to be worn as regular shoes at other jobs that, that people might have. So while it's only $600 and I, I realize it's a very small amount, um, I don't like that it comes out of the food service because yet again, we're using that as almost like a, as a slush fund because it has revenue coming in. Um, and then we're providing basic uniform stuff. You know, we're not providing aprons that stay here that can be universal. So I would, um, I would uh, recommend that we um, take that out. So if somebody wanted to make a motion for that one, I would, I would certainly entertain that. But yeah. Okay. Perfect. So uh, I don't know if is there other consensus elsewhere that. Okay. <laughs> Terry. But we all have to go to work and wear appropriate clothing at times too. And unless you're on TV or unless you're a CEO, um, you're not getting provided, you know, clothing budgets typically. Um, so, and, and to me, there's no difference whether it's safety or whether it's apparel. I think it's all falls in the same category, and I think it gets us into a slippery slope um, with that. Teachers have a dress code to come to work as well. Um, and there's, it's not, pro we don't provide money for that. It, they pay for that themselves if you, you know, with that. But the uniform, yeah, you know, the aprons and things like that are, um, they stay here when they go. I, it's that, it's the fact that we're buying them shoes that they get to work here for X period of time and take home with them at when they leave um, is where my concern is. And it, it just feels uncomfortable. I guess I don't feel strongly, <laughs> but you asked. No, that's fine. Um, I, I, I mean, show of hands if we want to keep this in there. If we want to, let's show of hands if we want to take this out. I think that's the easiest way to do this. Okay. I think so fine. four votes to take it out. Do we have an issue? Okay, sorry, you looked like it was, we should be evacuating because there's a bunch of kids running out of the library. So <laughs> I'm gonna be the first one through that door if there's a fire. Um, so, so Amy, if we can take those out. Gone. Thank you. Um, Magic. Any other items on that list that we are, that anybody that has any issues with before we can talk about the per domain leader? Okay, uh, in terms of the domain leader, I think, do we have any more information on what that, workload schedule will be in that first year um, when this happens next year? Do we know how much of this is going to touch AMS and touch Clark Wilkins? Well, I, I like the idea of the program and I like the idea of dividing the costs up like we do for a lot of other positions at the SAU level. If this is primarily a nine through 12 or even a primarily seven through 12 program, I don't know that um, it's in our interest to be funding a position that's not gonna be touching the um, you know K through six or K through eight. Yeah, whatever the whatever it is. It's, yeah. The intention is for it to be truly K through 12, uh, but we're going to learn about this as we implement it. How much time is really divided up between the two? So we're we put a budgeted amount in there as a placeholder, but the the reality is we're going to be asking that person to keep 
track of their time so that we can charge back appropriately. Not down to the minute. We're not going to be that specific about it. Right, but we are going. <laughs> we do our accounting. Um, but we are going to charge it on a fair basis. So this, this is an estimate because we really truly don't know how much time will be distributed between the buildings. This is in the interest of acting as if we're one district, which is you don't typically in one district allocate resources per building uh, quite mm -hmm. so specifically, but we know we need to do that, and so we will uh, when, the, when the time comes. So this, what's included right now is simply a ballpark estimate. Is everybody else okay with that? That, that makes sense to me as long as it's not a hard and fast 25 right now, um, you know, without knowing. Amy, you keep putting numbers in there. What, what are you doing to me in. right now? I put in the, the um, I put in the wrong. Would you like to give a live update on there? You want to wait until the SEU <laughs> presentation? <laughs> in the wrong place. Oh, so it's not the fuel cap. It's no. Okay. There we go. I was, I was quite impressed when you came up with the fuel I don't have that yet, no. <laughs> um, next, go ahead, Victoria. Yep. Yeah, okay, so I, I just wanna kind of wrap my head around this. So, um, so this position, if it was at a quarter of their time, would cost the Amherst School District 31, 33,000? Yep, uh, 34. Okay. Um, so this yeah. person, so 34. So it's 25% of that. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and it's, it, what is it fully loaded? Did you say one something? 135. 135. Okay. Did, did you have a question? Or you were just no, clarifying the numbers? Clarify okay. The so the numbers that just came in, it's about 30, just over almost 32,000, or 33,000. Um, yeah, about 34,000, and that's one fourth of the overall position, benefits, retirement, everything that yep. goes along with that. Yep. And based on the actual usage in the AMS level, it will be prorated accordingly when the time comes next year. So, okay. Um, I would at least think for the first year it would be, until, especially until you start to implement more programs at the elementary level and, um, you know, accordingly with that, so. Could we make it 20% on the assumption that it is probably high? You can do whatever you want. <laughs> I'm clear about that. I, you know, the uh, our plan would be to utilize the position as appropriate to build our programs and keep track of the time. If, if we were under budgeted, everything in our, you know, a lot of things in our budget are fluid and we might have to charge more than you budgeted. So do what you're comfortable with. Our best estimate is that 25% will cover us. Okay. If we take 20, does that mean we're essentially pushing 80 to Sauhegan? Uh, minus the part for Mount Vernon. Right. I mean, I, I'm comfortable with the 25 given that ultimately, um, the bulk of this is going to impact the Amherst taxpayer in the same way. Um, and I'd rather slightly overestimate. And we kick off a strings program sooner than we thought than underestimate. And frankly, I don't want to get into a game where we're pushing all but 5% to Sauhegan and they say, well, screw this. We're going to put 50% back on, you know, we're only going to cover 50% and put the rest back on Mont Vernon or something. So I think that this is a, um, an appropriate way to handle it for the first year and then we can adjust accordingly um, knowing that that was part of the plan altogether so um, next up was we had talked about AMS furniture I know Bethany we had talked about kind of that long-term plan I, and we I said there were no expectations but I would at least check in tonight if you had you know what that plan looked like in terms of what actually needed to be replaced as opposed to what was part of a five-year nice to have plan uh, did you have a chance to talk connect with Roger and facilities on that okay Um, so we've just started looking at all of that and we'll have we'll have some more updates on the chairs and things like that. I've, I've gone through a few rooms. Sure. Um, they're not in good shape at all, but we'll have more numbers and, and more information for the next board meeting. Perfect. And that's what we talked about at the uh, the budget workshop we had last week. So that's completely fine. Uh, next item I had on my list was we had discussed a tuition um, amount for the preschool program. So I will, I'll, Beth, I'll let you start with this because I know that you were, um, you were, uh, you were talking about this before and you were big on this. So well. I thought we should discuss it at least. Uh, raising the tuition 
in the preschool program for students that are attending um, without an IEP or without um, the federal funding that, that covers this part of it. Yeah, so it, our last budget workshop, um, we had talked about the tuition that is currently paid um, into the preschool program by general ed students, I think is the appropriate place to say it. Um, part of it does offset some of the costs of the preschool program. We did a little bit of research very quickly during the meeting and found out that we are significantly lower than surrounding preschools. Um, in, like insanely lower, like two to three thousand dollars lower um, in some of it. So I, as kind of a quick discussion, we all kind of said we need to take a look at that number and increase it. Um, I think there's sort of been some general discussion in the past about it, but we never did anything about it. So I think there was a question of do we need a board motion to actually make this happen? I don't believe you need a board motion to set that rate. I think you could simply direct me via consensus to evaluate our rate and make adjustments for next year. So if that's what the board would like me to do, then I can, can do yeah. that. Can you come back to us with what you are going to change that to when the time comes? Happy to. Thanks. I believe the term was if you were going to change that, what you were going to change that to. <laughs> it was a very leading question. So when you change this, Adam, and uh, you let us know what it's changed to. A strong feel from all of us is it needs to change at least some way. <laughs> but yeah, Got it. And the last thing I think we wanted to focus on, and I think it was further highlighted. Sorry, Beth, did you have another thought? Oh, nope, I okay. Thought, sorry, it's the whole budget workshop, but apparently I just slipped. Like, okay. Off of this slide. Uh, one of the items we discussed was enrichment that we have that opportunity now for um, some of the kids in kindergarten. We have the reading enrichment program. So having that interventionist and there were um, positions that we were going to be have to have to be moving or, you know, with the addition of some positions, we might lose that interventionist. Have, have we made any, is there any further information that we don't have on that at this point um, to ensure that we can try to keep this enrichment? And I think looking at the, some of the NEWA scores, I think it's pretty vital that we have, have that interventionist. Uh, we're working through that right now, Mr. Chair. Um, our goal is to uh, find a way to fund the interventionist with our current staffing model. Uh, I think the board is well aware that at kindergarten we have uh, classroom paraprofessionals in addition to kindergarten teachers. And finding the right balance of teachers, paraprofessionals, and interventionist positions is a priority for us. Um, and so we might very well be recommending a change to the board that either uh, keeps the budget uh, the same as it is right now, but ideally lowers it. So. We're committed to getting that interventionist position funded, but without Adam convincing us. Okay. So those are the items that I had on my checklist for tonight. Did anybody else have anything else that they would like to bring up? And those are the notes that we took out of the our, our budget workshop last week as well. Josh? Uh, in the capital items um, area, I'm just wondering, so there's a $1 line for potential site improvements. Is that just if something breaks, Roger has then the, the ability to move some money in to fix it? Okay. We put a dollar in the 4,000 amount yeah. that we have that ability. Okay. And then other professional services, what does that entail? <laughs> Is that a function site one? It's under the uh, capital items sub list. Okay. I'm trying to pull it up now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there's some other details, Mr. Chair, that I think probably would be better. Is the budget submission question submission still open? Okay. I think it'd probably be better and more appropriate to do it there. And then if there's further things in December, we can we can go over it there. Um. So I'm not going. I'm not willing to make a motion yet. However, um, I do. I would like to see. Um, the staffing request at Clark Wilkins or Wilkins for that first grade um, position to have a second look at it. One, I I don't believe the enrollment projection from kindergar current kindergarten to next year's first grade is super accurate based on 
you know, past increase, it's only increased, you know, it's only estimating 11 kids joining. We do tend to have more um, coming in in any given year. You know, we've had 15, 16, even more than that. Um, but I do, where we're trying to produce a lean budget, um, you know, I'm wondering if that position, especially if we're able to work with an interventionist over at Clark to make that happen, um, it would open up the ability. Um, I, I don't know. I, I I would. I'm not saying I definitely want it cut yet, but it's definitely something that I would like um, looked at. It's still, you know, depending on what the enrollment is, um, it would still keep us within our goals um, to have six teachers there instead of the seven, um, but it's something that I would at least like to look at. Uh, so two things, I think that you're right to be questioning that uh, because um, we are not sure how many kids are gonna show up for first grade next year. Uh, one thing with-, with First grade or kindergarten, sorry. First grade. Okay. Both really, but first grade in particular because uh, there's been a number of parents uh, that we've heard of anecdotally who have kept their kids home uh, for kindergarten because of COVID and are gonna show up in first grade um, or have repeated kindergarten in a, in a community preschool program or daycare setting. And, and so that it is possible, there's no way to know this, but it is possible that there'll be a bigger jump in first grade next year and we just don't know that. My second uh, uh, thing I wanna mention is uh, there was a question about the disparity earlier between the village school and Clark Wilkins in terms of state test scores. Um, one of the root causes or one of the factors that uh, has to be discussed is font size. Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon Village School has a smaller font size and um, uh, historically through research that's shown to be primarily uh, beneficial, especially at the early grades, especially when kids are learning how to read and especially at, pre at preventing the future need for intervention and special education down the road. So just a thought that uh, the investment in the early grade level uh, class sizes is one of the best bangs for the buck for the tax credit. And I would add to that, or or not counter that with, because you mentioned that you're already analyzing it anyway. But I would imagine that this is a it's something we discussed last year when Ellen Grugin was a board member. Um, you know, really analyzing that para program to make sure that a one to one at the kindergarten level and wherever else we have them is that the best utilization of those resources, whereas opposed to another teacher in another grade might, you know, might lower the. Um, the average number of kids in that class. So I think you've already indicated that you're um, looking into that program as a whole. So I, am, I won't belabor the point tonight, but I think it's worth highlighting that and commenting on. Victoria? Yep, um, I'd just like to piggyback what we're discussing there. When we talk about smaller class sizes, we only have a certain amount of classrooms. Thank you. And while we're talking about this, I, I'm not sure if it's this first grade position or which position, um, but when we're talking about making that position, that other classroom, what we would see next year is music on a cart, which puts music next door to classrooms that are learning, which is the situation that we found ourselves in after the portable caught on fire a couple of years ago, which was part of what prompted us to look at our facility programming. Um, so I just, it all ties back together. And I think it's just important for all of us to realize and, and keep it in the forefront that this is, this is why we're talking about a facility project. Um, and this is why we're trying to get the budget as low as we can, because we know that we're putting a lot out there to the taxpayer. Any further thoughts on budget items for tonight? Would the board be willing to make a motion to accept those items that were discussed? That's right where I was going. Thank you. So I will take a motion then after our uh, presentation from Ms. Facey, all of the items that were added to the proposed changes after 10-4 tab, uh, that includes a lot of the health insurance payouts, um, basically up to line 754 if you're on the budget, health insurance payouts, and then a few things that were added that were omitted um, innocently before. So I would like to take a motion to accept those changes to get us an updated uh, budget number as of tonight. And just clarifying, are you including the performance arts domain made? Yes, I'm including the, yes, I am including that one. I was, I skipped on the school bus contract one. Okay. So I, yes, I cut it off everything except for the school bus contract, the fuel projections, which will be coming uh, hopefully next week at the SAU meeting. We'll have a better idea as to what that's gonna be yes. as we're already experiencing that. Yes. So I will take that motion that was very sloppily worded. If you need me to say it again today, I can do that. Okay. Uh, Victoria, 
Second, Josh. All in favor? Five and, and opposed? None. And so, Tom, just to um, briefly go over the process mm -hmm. uh, going forward. So we'll have uh, Ways and Means final report in December. Right, Kelly? Yeah. Exactly. yeah. They, Well, it's typically come after we decide on a final budget in December. Once we make our final decision that this is what we're going to present, you can look at it and you guys, you do your vote at that point. Our meeting is December 6th, I believe is the date. So I, I assume if all goes according to plan, we'll be able to make all those decisions that night. Great. But early enough in December where you guys have time to meet right after that and approve or, um, you know, make your recommendations or approve or vote on what we've put, what we're going to put on the ballot at that point. Great. So... So at the, the next board meeting, the board will be making um, decisions on the budget, on the capital reserve fund, and the bond. Correct. Okay. Now, pending Great. any drastic changes between now and then, um, I, we do reserve the right to host another workshop to kind of go over some of that information. Yes. I'd rather do it before December 6th. I agree. Thanksgiving is I'm there. I'm hoping there's no more bad news. Correct. Or bad news, good news, <laughs> whatever it might be. But I just, I, if, if there is a significant change. Yeah. Um, I'll let you know. Yeah. Well, and we'll be able to meet before December 6th. And then that way, December 6th can be our final one to give you time to put everything together and then give ways and means time to um, make their final uh, vote. Yes or no on that as well. So. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Okay. Do we have a non-public tonight? Nope, nope, there we go. Yeah, we did. It was five nothing. Yep. No, Mr. Chair. Okay. So, with that, I will take a motion to adjourn tonight. No, I, before I do that, not yet, I will take any public comments. Seeing no public comments, now I will take a motion to adjourn. I have a motion from Beth, seconded by Victoria. All in favor? The ayes have it, five to nil.